What makes a film weird? Is it the execution of the story, or is it the subject matter itself? In the case of this Japanese horror comedy, it's very clearly both, as not only the creation of the film proved to be unconventional on all fronts, but the narrative also displayed an abstract and nearly childlike understanding of storytelling. While it may have been seen as the death of the golden age of Japanese cinema, it has inspired and shocked the masses, becoming the mark of absurdity by which all films must be measured up to. Hi, my name is Magnus, and today we're going to be talking about spine number 537. Haosu, or House. Nobuhiko Obayashi is certainly a strange one when it comes to filmmaking. His story can be seen as one of success even though nearly all of the crew that worked on House and his artistic peers thought of him as a childish and showy amateur that would bring the Japanese film scene to a screeching halt. While studio budgets for film in the 1960s were declining, commercial budgets were skyrocketing as Japan entered its economic boom. Riding on the coattails of this trend was a young experimental filmmaker by the name of Nobuhiko Obayashi. His commercials were noted as visual eye candy that were perfectly suited for capturing the imaginations of would-be buyers. During this time, he also directed an extended short film called Emotion that would appear in show halls in 1966. Its use of rapidly shifting imagery, a multilingual narrative, and silent film-inspired aesthetics caught the eyes of even more television executives. His commercials through the 70s became very prominent in Japanese culture and featured big-name actors such as Kirk Douglas and Charles Bronson. Then in 1975, Steven Spielberg released his thriller masterpiece Jaws, and sales for the film went through the roof. It had a huge impact in every market that it was played in, and legendary Japanese production company Toho wanted a film like Jaws so they could compete in their ever-shrinking field. Of all people, they contacted Nobuhiko Obayashi to develop a script for them that would be both intellectually intriguing while capitalizing on raw thrills. So he decided to create a film that would draw horror out of the unexplainable, a child's mind. To this end, he drew inspiration from his daughter Chigumi. She told him about her wild dreams including mirrors that would attack people and watermelons emerging from wells as human heads. Obayashi loved these ideas because they could only be properly represented presented on film. He told his screenwriting buddy Chiho Katsura about these ideas and it reminded him of children's tales by Walter de la Mer wherein a house would eat its inhabitants. Obayashi also made sure to add in a storyline that connected to the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He was a Hiroshima native and all of his childhood friends were killed in the blast, and he felt like the idea of being torn apart by unforeseeable circumstances fit the themes of the story quite well. So Katsura wrote the script and Obayashi presented it to Toho and it was almost immediately greenlit. The problem was that no director working at Toho wanted to work with such a ridiculous concept. Obayashi offered to direct the film himself, but he was not allowed due to his contractor status. However, he was allowed to advertise the fact that the project had been greenlit. And advertise he did, as the script for House quickly turned into a manga, novelization, and radio play. To top it all off, the score that was made for the film was completed over a year before production on House would start. This lapse in development also allowed Obayashi to find all of his actors for the film by vocally auditioning them during the radio plays. All of these marketing pushes became pop culture phenomenons that Toho simply couldn't avoid, and after coming to the realization that they needed a hit to stay afloat, they caved in and allowed Obayashi to direct House, and subsequently create one of the most cheerful and energetic horror films ever devised. House is an essential purchase among Criterion collectors. Not only did it not have a release in the United States before the Criterion edition, but its reputation as the midnight movie to rival Rocky Horror Picture Show had me hooked from day one. The cover displays one of the more disturbing scenes in the film, revolving around a picture of Auntie's cat Blanche. We'll get to that later. I also love the typography used in the House logo, as it's both a modernized version of the title shown in the film while also making homage to it with the titular House resting in the U. Oddly enough, I like the back info page more than the front cover because because I feel that it represents the overall art style of the film much better. But that's simply preference. The front cover has become iconic among fans of the film, and rightfully so. The disc art uses the insignia found on the decals around the house and Auntie's diary, and the booklet contains a great informational read on the wild production and release of this film. It's also a really well-made collage of the amazing imagery and visual effects implemented in-house. Speaking of collages, another can be found on the inside case, showing Obayashi's unique sense of style as well as the hype and culture surrounding the film. While there are only only a few supplements on the disc, they're all very insightful and help to give us a greater understanding of the creation of this film. The first is an appreciation by modern horror director Ty West, the second is a retrospective documentary piece on how House came to be, and the last is Obayashi's short film Emotion, which is absolutely trippy in the best way. While I can't even begin to tell you what the plot is, many of the in-camera tricks used in House can be found here and it's totally worth a watch even if you don't understand what's happening. Criterion's version is a 2K transfer and I was lucky enough to get it for 10 bucks. 
Dogs. So here's some information on this film's release. House came out in 1977 and was a gigantic hit with the younger generation to the agony of more sophisticated filmgoers. It was released as the second part of a double feature with the film Pure Hearts and Mud. And well, that movie has garnered no attention nor attempts at critique in the modern age, so you can see why people were buying their tickets. It runs for 88 minutes and has an aspect ratio of 133 to 1, meaning that pronounced bars will appear on the side of the screen. It's spoken in Japanese with English subtitles, and I might say that an epilepsy warning is warranted. This film is a bit crazy to say the least, and I've enlisted the help of my friend Alpha Alpaca Pack to help me explain why this film needs to be seen. Hey, it's good to be here, man. <laughs> Hi. Okay, alrighty then. It's good to have you here, dude. Thanks for joining me. Why don't you tell the good people what this film is about? Well, House begins with our main character, Gorgeous, breaking away from her dad after he brings home her new fiancé from his overseas job as a composer. Still distraught over the death of her mother, she contacts her aunt and asks to visit her house in the country with her friends, instead of joining her father and his fiancé on vacation. It gets weird pretty quick. Needless to say, if you haven't seen the film, go watch it first. It is truly a one-of-a-kind experience. And what makes it so one-of-a-kind is actually pretty hard to pinpoint since there are so many unique flavors to this film. So let's start by looking at the film as a whole before delving into its complexities. Welcome to the house. Something that must be made clear from the very first minute is that House is by and large a fantasy film, something that is very apparent when taking the bizarre and supernatural second half of the film into consideration. However, the world outside the house and even the characters themselves seem to be completely separate from our own reality, not only in the way they act, but also in how their psyches seem to appropriately degrade over time. This has a pretty cool effect later on as this inability to distinguish what is and is not happening adds significant weight to the overall story. To start, let's establish the characters and their interests. Our main character is Gorgeous, a stylish and attractive schoolgirl whose father has promised to take her on an extensive vacation when he comes home. Her best friend is Fantasy, a classmate that likes to turn the mundane into the unimaginable by taking photos and creating wild stories out of them. They belong to a clique at their school that seemingly looks like any other, but when you dissect each character by name, you might see why they all hang out together. Among them is Prof, which I'm going to assume is short for Professor, a timid but outspoken intellectual that uses science to provide an explanation for the wild occurrences in her life and the events of the film. Sweet likes anything that has to do with the lighthearted and innocent. Kung Fu is an athlete that lives up to her name on multiple occasions. You starting to see a trend here? Mac is constantly gorging herself with junk food and is playfully made fun of for her infinite hunger. I originally thought that her name was a reference to the McDonald's Big Mac, but no, it's actually a shortening of the word stomach. This movie is really too much sometimes. And finally, Melody is a musical prodigy who enjoys entertaining her friends. By now, you've probably noticed why this group works as a group in the first place. Their names are literal representations of their characteristics. Almost every named character in the film wears their name through their actions, and it's honestly kind of funny as far as character development goes. There is legitimately a character named Watermelon Man. Fucking hard to guess what that guy's life's purpose is. It's already pretty bad that the actors have been forced into roles that are pretty one-dimensional, but there's one more thing that really makes these characters stand out. The acting is fucking terrible. <laughs> Even most people that find it difficult to judge a foreign actor's performance generally agree that they barely even qualify as amateur actors. There's a reason for this. Obayashi was trying to find people that physically fit the role and almost entirely disregarded their acting abilities. Six out of the seven main characters had no acting experience prior to shooting. However, they certainly had the photogenic qualities that Obayashi was looking for as most of them were models. All of the girls that you see in the film today were unwittingly vocally auditioned during the airing of the house radio play. And were later asked by the director to be to join in on the creation of the film. Kimiko Ikigami and Yoko Minamita were the only two actors in the entire film that had any acting experience whatsoever. The rest were either production members or personal friends of Obayashi. A notable guest starring role was given to Kiyohiko Ozaki, a country singer that shared Obayashi's hobby of horseback riding. Just for those who are wondering, he played Mr. Togo, fantasy's way inappropriately older boyfriend. In essence, the cast were either new blood or someone that Obayashi already knew, and in the end, that's 
it's sort of admirable. Why have one great guest performance that blows the rest out of the water when you could fashion a unique style out of their subpar acting? This line of thought will apply to a lot of the criticisms of House that we'll be discussing later. It adds loads to the world of House, which is easily a character in and of itself. Not only do we have a house possessed by a virgin-eating demon, but the cartoonish and lively town that the characters embark from is filled to the brim with idiosyncratic enigmas that reflect the temperaments of our main characters. To name just a few, there are shoemakers that seem to be aware of the soundtrack playing in the background. The band that composed the songs for the film, Gunslingers from the Old West, the stars of what appears to be a romance film with Obayashi himself playing the lead actor, and so many others it's simply comical. These random side characters contribute to the subconscious charm of House, the unexplainable. It's especially interesting to note that all of these characters meet and pass at a train station, almost as if they're going from set to set, but that's simply conjecture. We've already had quite a few meta film references in just the first couple of minutes and almost no attention is devoted to them. What's so special about this minimal attention given to the outside world is that it reinforces the supernatural and fantasy elements found in the house while distracting the audience from the horror still to come. It's a funny movie, which is why it's so disturbing to see the light-hearted breaks from reality that become increasingly important to the plot. Fantasy hallucinates that Mr. Togo has come to save them after some of the girls go missing in a sequence that has him pick her up in a grassy field donning full prince attire. Giant letters spelling the end even flash on screen before she's pulled back into reality. While this is the most drastic and overt case of these occurrences, they're frequent throughout the entire stay in the house. There's also quite a bit of ambiguity regarding who the girls are actually interacting with, as we later discover that Auntie, among others, is more or less a ghost. The questioning of reality goes yet another step further, as some of the characters almost deny and in fact enjoy their deaths. Melody's demise via piano is a prime example of this. At first she's calmly aware that her fingers have been bitten off, only to scream in terror as her body is dragged into the piano. After a while, she finds it amusing that her torso is floating in midair and lets out wild laughs as she continues to be swallowed whole. This is easily one of the funniest and creepiest scenes in House, and possibly any film, demonstrating Obayashi's unique talent in blending the lines between horror and comedy. A lot of horror comedies are able to present both elements within their major scenes, but usually the horror ends up taking a backseat to the jokes. House is different in that it's simultaneously funny and scary. You almost have to question yourself when you laugh. It's a genuinely one-of-a-kind film in that regard. The story almost becomes meaningless in a way that's entirely excusable. It's tonally subversive and as many would come to find out, visually as well. It was quickly determined that House was visually overwhelming by both its fans and critics. For this reason, fans were in love with it while critics loathed its sensory overload. Obayashi was already familiar with in-camera effects, as he had displayed his love and appreciation for them in his short film Emotion. However, 11 years had passed since the production of that film at House. Editing techniques and effect technologies had subsequently been improved upon drastically. With this in mind, the film was geared to be as visually distinct as possible by completely breaking the convention of traditional storytelling through its visuals. An editor was instrumental in developing the pace of a film during the golden age of Japanese cinema. While most directors hired another staff member as a dedicated editor, modern auteurs like Akira Kurosawa were praised for personally turning his lengthy masterpieces The Hidden Fortress, The Bad Sleep Well, and notably Seven Samurai into adventures that would unfold at breakneck speeds. Even today, it's still rare for big studio directors to edit their own films. But Kurosawa made a name for himself by doing just that. While Obayashi himself was much more concerned with the technical creation of the film, he knew that the delivery of the story had to mirror the bizarre content that he would capture. After shooting and wrapped, Obayashi spent a considerable amount of time with editor Nobuo Ogawa in post-production, shaping the odd and often experimental structure invoked by the film's off-kilter sense of narrative progression. The practical effects used in this film are already fantastic, but the sheer amount employed on House is simply staggering. To name a few, here are the big ones. Chroma key blue screen removal, animation overlays, pinhole focus cutting, 
cutouts, frame rate and time manipulation, claymation, picture and picture edits, stop frame animation, multiple frame overlay, not only color correction, but extreme color correction, match cuts, fades, and vintage film transitions, and so many more that it's seriously hard to keep track. What makes this work in house specifically is the use of wild editing in conjunction with the surreal and often ingenious practical effects. I think it would be a safe bet to assume that the film was edited to match the cartoonish style found in the imagery itself. This is where the cinematography and blocking become major components in House's style, because it seems like physics have totally different laws in Obayashi's film world. Take, for instance, Sweet's hat falling slowly but gracefully back onto her head, or Kung Fu's wild feats of athletic skill. These stunts were performed through wiring that would attach to an object or actress that were later removed during editing. The angle at which things are shot from is also very important to the staging and intended impact of a scene. When Sweet is later eaten by mattresses in a closet, we actually view her demise from below. This was achieved by elevating the set and replacing the floor with a glass surface with the same lattice work found on the original floor. The camera is also very often in motion, panning around on an actress to reveal something in the background, or pushing back and forth between two actresses during a conversation. The focal length is also very short, and establishment and landscape shots are rarely used. One of the most prominent shots is used in the character introduction scene, which has each character's face acid burned into the screen as they walk across a bridge. It's also super amusing that this comes a full 20 minutes into the film after we've heard and seen all of the characters interact and use each other's names in conversation. This was, to Alpaca and I, the first major indicator of a stilted pacing issue. House is only 88 minutes, but it feels far longer than it actually is. You could attribute this to the bizarre editing choices or disturbing imagery, but I think the answer can be found in the writing itself. I don't think that either of us would be willing to say that the writing is bad, but there are some very heavy lapses in storytelling logic that defy the highly innovative visual style. It still functions as we believe Obayashi meant it to, but there could have been some more flow to the narrative at large. As we've said before, House has somewhat of a meta film edge, and the story and effects are both fairly satirical in their own unique ways. And yes, you heard that correctly, even the effects are supposed to be a part of the joke. Obayashi specifically wanted the effects to look amateur and intentionally fake. The blood used in the terrifying finale is clearly water that was given a food color additive to make it look red, and almost every single backdrop representing the sky is hilariously unrealistic. And you can tell that they're just matte paintings. But it's consistent, and it already fits with the cartoon aesthetic. Just like the issue with poor acting, why make one element stand out with a great performance, or in this case a convincing effect, when everything could be uniform and stylistically unique? Again, it's important to remind you guys that we're not criticizing the film for a lack of quality. If anything, we're praising the film for sticking to one aesthetic and using it to characterize itself. Quality seems to be an improper term, because at the end of the day, the imagery is effective. It's unrealistic to us when we're unconditioned to the film world, which is why watching these scenes out of context might not look so horrifying, but their surreal qualities pop in the set pieces of violent death and murder. Just to name one instance where this completely works is Prof's death in the Sea of the House's Blood, which is yet another genius use of prop manipulation and post-production trickery. By this point, all of the house's furniture has come alive, and Prof realizes that the picture of Auntie's cat, Blanche, is one of the central weak points of the house, and by proxy, Auntie herself. Kung Fu kicks it, and it starts vomiting blood. Well, not before her torso was ripped in half by a lampshade. Oh. Right. This effect of having Prof's body slowly dissolve in the blood was actually made by suspending her in front of a blue backdrop while the same color of paint was thrown at her. This makes it look like she's breaking apart chunk by chunk, and while there's obvious visual tearing here, it doesn't really matter. This is still in line with the other effects, so the idea of uniformity is consistent throughout. This movie is extremely rough and wild, and it wouldn't be the same with a cleaner presentation. Now, there are a few effects that were stacked that I really didn't care for, but my complaints are almost entirely subjective. During this segment, the camera is surprised surprisingly handheld where the rest of the film has been shot on a mobile crane. This effect was already enough for me, but the super choppy frame rate sort of took me out of it. At the end of the day, it's just my opinion and I don't feel that it hurts the film in the slightest. Plus, it never really stood out to me as an issue at all, which just goes to show how different individual responses are to this film. House is a visual masterpiece, so it might not come as a surprise that it sounded just as good. When House was first being advertised as a greenlit production of Toho, Obayashi contacted yet another friend to work on the film for him. Asei Kobayashi had worked on a ton of Obayashi's commercials as a composer, and due to the nature of the synchronous editing style, they were in frequent contact. He accepted the job as head composer and made the highly involved piano pieces. After finishing work on these pieces, he made a suggestion to Obayashi that younger people should work on the soundtrack as well, and suggested that his performing artist, Miki Yoshino, should contribute. Yoshino just so happened to be a member of a young but talented rock band by the 
the name of Godaigo. Now that Kobayashi had a much more limited role as a composer, Obayashi offered him a role as the infamous Watermelon Man. It was a stroke of casting genius as Kobayashi's deep and haunting voice uttered the title in such a way that it has become instantly recognizable. <laughs> Having the music done early also helped in more ways than just saving on production time. The score was used to create an atmosphere on set that fit the cheerful vibe that Obayashi had envisioned. He literally played games and sang with the actresses in between takes. He wanted filming to be fun and felt that it would reflect on the mood of the final product. His technical crew even had fun, but they all felt like the film was complete trash. Most of them were told that the film did have a serious element that involved the Second World War, but it didn't play out like most of them thought it would. The plot itself is heavily reliant on the Second World War as an explanation as to why the house is haunted, but most of the crew just didn't see it. That might be because of the effects-heavy delivery of this information, but still, the subtext of separation by unforeseeable events has always been a part of the story. To be fair, a lot of audiences were confused when this plot point was introduced, and I can kind of see why. On the train, Gorgeous tells of how her aunt was separated from her fiancé due to the wartime draft, and the presentation of this scene is seemingly impossible as the girls watch and comment on what was to be presumed as a flashback scene of the aunt and her fiancé. And going back to the music, a lot of people didn't get why rock music was being played right alongside scenes of graphic murder either. In retrospect, Kobayashi proved to be forward thinking in his ideology that a new sound must be brought in by the younger generation, but a lot of people at the time saw the inclusion of rock music as trashy. The same can be said of the nude scenes. While it's not like they were anything new in Japanese cinema, the way that these scenes were incorporated into the narrative were lambasted as distasteful and exploitative. Some even accused Obayashi of being a pervert due to the age of the girls. But like many of the initial criticisms of the film, these unconventional measures were taken to experiment with film itself. It also seemed that Obayashi was willing to play with his audience as well. One of the girls mentions the film pure hearts in the mud very abruptly in the middle of a major scene, making many confused as to why it was included. Pure and simple, it was a joke, and it was something that Obayashi hadn't seen many films at the time do. During a time of stagnation, House was able to breathe some new life into the film economy, not just financially, but philosophically. So with all of this being said, how do we even begin to classify this film? House is not a perfect film, however it is a film where this happens. It's a powerhouse of creativity and originality, which is pretty strange when you consider that this film was born out of a need to produce a similar product to Jaws out of competition. The majority of what most would consider to be flaws actually plays to the strengths of the unique pop horror blend. The editing and effects are innovative in every sense of the word, and the haunting but hilarious vibe is yet to be properly matched by anything in recent memory. House isn't focused on being perfect, it's focused on being entertaining. There are technical glitches and plot inconsistencies are plenty, but the the experience of watching the film in one full sitting cannot be summed up by mere words. We have a deep appreciation for what Obayashi was trying to do, and in the end, he lived up to his intentions. He used cinema to show the unexplainable. This is one of the best films of both cult cinema and the Criterion Collection, and you need to see it if you haven't already. So go get it, or I'll burn your face clean off. House is an absolute treasure. It's bizarre, it's weird, and it needs to be seen. I'd like to thank Alpha Alpaca Pack for joining me on this odd and twisted journey. It was good to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Well, I mainly do film reviews on my channel, but once in a black sun I'll make a video essay. Like this one I did on Neon Genesis Evangelion. Please, please watch it. I really, I really need to feed my ignoring crack addiction. But um, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm done selling my soul. Back to you, man. Seriously, subscribe to the man. He's got some great videos on film subjects that most don't care to ever analyze, and they're all top-notch. 
As always, a like and subscribe push me a long way, and if you're feeling generous, you can donate to my Patreon, where you can receive exclusive content and be credited as a producer on my future videos. Links to my social media and everything else is in the description below. My name is Magnus Prophecy, and I'll see you guys later. Have a good one.